Would you please give a big welcome to Andrew Grell. If we're going to talk about the Web3 and things that are new, let's cast our mind back to 1989. So Tim Berners-Lee has developed a thing called the World Wide Web. It is a way of structuring information. And when you type in www. That is a way to help structure information, and that was the birth of the internet. Now, if we're talking about Web3, you're probably asking Andrew, well, then what's Web1 and Web2? I'm glad you asked. Web1.0 is read-only. I found on a website called archive.org, it goes back in time, I found my website from the 18th of October 2000. Looks a bit basic. It's got some photos and what I was doing, and I've just been to the Olympics, I think. But this was read-only, and a lot of websites still are read-only. You can't do anything with them. So then we progress to Web 2, where you can read and write. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these are websites where you have, as an individual, a way to contribute to the conversation. So you can read stories, you can actually publish. That's Web 2. And in fact, most of the things we're doing today are Web 2. So then you ask, well, what is Web 3? Well, Web 3 is read, write, and own. The issue with Web 2 and Web 1 was they're all owned by these big tech companies. If you want to put something on Facebook, you have to agree to Facebook's terms and conditions. So if we want to actually do our own thing and have a bit more control as consumers and, and, uh, and um, the, the public in general, then we want to have some way of actually playing with that. And that brings us to the metaverse. Now again, as an actionable futurist, I like to understand from first principles, what is this all about? Where did the word metaverse come from? Actually, back in 1992, a gentleman called Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Snow Crash. And he coined the term metaverse, or so he thinks. No one else has come and said it's not true. He had a character in there called Hero. Hero's not actually here at all, he said. He's in a computer-generated universe that his computer is drawing onto his goggles and pumping into his earphones. Sound familiar? In the lingo, this imaginary place is known as the metaverse. So the terminology has been, been around for a long, long time. And the trouble with the metaverse is the term is actually overused. I've seen some presentations where you know, we talk about things like websites, now it's all in the metaverse. A few years ago, it was all on the blockchain. In fact, there was a funny uh, Google Chrome plugin that add the words on the blockchain to every sentence on a screen. So people misuse this. So if we then look at the metaverse more closely, there's actually a great white paper from a guy called Sam Gilbert at University of Cambridge. Now, by the way, all the websites, all the videos, everything I mentioned today will be on the world's biggest QR code behind me on the last slide. So you can take pictures of this, but if you want links to all of this, there'll be a QR code at the end with all these links on it. And Sam's a bit of a pragmatist. He says that in terms of Web3 or the metaverse, it's open, persistent, real-time, interoperable virtual world that could be built using Web3 technologies. Now, the important words there are interoperable. The reason you can leave London and go to Paris and your mobile phone works is because all the systems work together. There have been standards that have been developed over years to say, if you turn your phone on in France, then it will just work. The problem with the metaverse today is that some pundits, and I'm one of them, agree that it doesn't actually exist as a homogenous thing. There are lots of metaverses, there are lots of metaversal activity. And Sam goes on to say that NFTs, we'll talk about those, blockchain, smart contracts and cryptocurrencies provide the payments and legal infrastructure needed to complement these virtual reality. That's the own part. So I can read, write, and I can own. So this is a fundamental shift in what we've seen before, and it's giving power and control back into your hands, and that's really important. So let's look at how the metaverse has evolved since Neil Stevenson in uh, 1992. Who here has heard of Second Life? It was around since 2003, it's still there. It has about 300,000 people that use it every day. So it hasn't gone away. And if you look at the graphics there, they're okay. Let's fast forward to uh, Facebook or Meta as they're called and Horizon Worlds. Um, that's from a few weeks ago. Now to get to that point, I read yesterday, it's taken Meta $10 billion a year. And Meta expects to spend about $70 billion over the life of their Metaverse project. Let's put that into context. To develop the Apple iPhone cost Apple about $3.2 billion, and they've sold about $1.6 trillion of iPhones. So a huge investment for a big upside. If I had spent $10 billion to get that far from there to there, I'd be a little bit disappointed. So I am a metaverse skeptic in that the technology is there, and everything I talk about today has promise, but let's not overhype it. And today what we want to talk about is how can you use these new technologies in your industry? But let's not go too early because some people will go, you're just playing in the metaverse because you can. 
When I've been researching, I've spent many months, because I want to get across this, I'm digitally curious, what does the metaverse mean? And the other day I hit on it, and it's not my world, but if you think about gaming, the metaverse started its life in the gaming world. I want to win something, I want to gamify something, I want to change character, I want to buy a new sword, I want to buy a new horse. So if you think about the metaverse as coming from a gaming point of view, the way people game, the way they like gamification, the way people like to compete in real life, and then you can see, okay, how can we extend from a gaming world into recruitment, into finance, into logistics? Yeah.